Hey everybody, it's Tim from Lanessa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining us again today. Today we are talking about the top 10 cold weather tips for sheep and goats. Stay tuned to find out more. As always, you can contact us at www.lanessafarms.com. Send us a text, send us an email, send us a letter. Whatever it is that you got to do. Hey, it is two degrees outside. Yeah, holy smoke. So uh, I think the wind chill right now is two. And here we are in Indiana. And it got me thinking, um, yeah, there's some stuff that you need to know when it comes to cold weather uh, with sheep and goats. We're going to go through about 10 little tips for you to think about. Tip number one, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, you don't want to lock up your animals nice and tight. We just went through this with a customer the other day. They've got animals that are, all have pneumonia. Um, and, you know, it seems like people care for their animals and they want to do what's best for them, and I get that. And they think that enclosing them up in a nice warm area is going to do them good, and it's not. It's going to make them sicker than a dog. Uh, basically what's going to end up happening is, is they're all going to get pneumonia. They're just not wired that way to be locked up indoors. Um, so... When you have them, uh, they need to be kept outside. They need to have a few other things to keep them healthy while they're outside in the cold. But yeah, as you can see in our building here, this is just a lean-to style shed. Uh, we have a few of these on the farm. Lots and lots of airflow, lots and lots of air circulation. Uh, keeps their respiratory system nice and healthy, but do not, do not, do not uh, keep them locked up where they don't get good airflow. All right, so tip number two, um, what do you need? Well, if you're not going to keep them locked up indoors, what do you need to do? Well, what you need to do is you need to protect them from wind and snow and rain. So other than that, you're good to go. And I know a lot of you are having questions about this, and you're saying, well, you know, what about back in the day, the way that they used to be raised, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I know they used to be out on pasture, and yep, that's all true. Once upon a time, they were all out on pasture and they had babies on pasture and they lived on pasture and all that was great. Uh, but that's not the way it is anymore. We've bred that out of them. Um, so if you leave these guys out on open pasture with no protection from wind or rain uh, or snow, they're going to freeze to death and they're going to die more than likely. Now, there are exceptions to that. There's breed exceptions to that. But uh, for the breeds that we raise and for most commercial breeds, no, that's not the case. So kind of the happy medium of everything. We are in an open air barn right here. Uh, the wind can kind of get some air circulation and things going around, but we don't have direct wind on the animals. They're not getting snowed on, they're not getting rained on. Uh, so they are protected in that regard. All right, so point number three that we wanna talk about is bedding. Now, generally speaking, bedding can be one of two things. It can either be straw or it can be uh, corn stalks and uh, corn waste for when they harvest on the cornfields. I prefer the corn. Uh, you don't want to use anything for bedding um, that the animals necessarily really want to eat. So don't make the mistake of getting like bad hay and you know you get moldy hay or something and you say well I can't use it for feed so I'm going to put it on the ground. Don't do that because they're going to eat it off the ground and then they're going to get sick. Um, this helps in a couple different ways. The main one is is this keeps uh, the conduction, the heat conduction, I'm not going to get into the laws of thermodynamics on here, but uh, we don't want them laying directly on frozen ground because it's going to actually pull the heat out of them. So by having this soft, um, having this soft bedding down here, uh, it just helps to insulate them from the cold ground. Now you can see it's slightly dusty. I don't know if you can see here, but when before I put my bedding down, I actually um, use barn lime and I lime the ground really well and then I put my bedding over top of it and what that does is it just helps to treat the ground keeps the ammonia levels down and helps to keep this nice dry and clean um, so yeah bedding very very important again if you don't have access to corn uh, you can use straw straw works fine um, I do think that the corn is a little bit easier to clean up um, but yeah that's it so a couple different thoughts on the bedding um, once it gets soiled, you can either dig it out or you can lay over top of it. 
eventually you're going to have to dig it out. And we do our dig outs about twice a year. Um, but yeah, that's, that's about it as far as bedding is concerned. Hey, have you subscribed yet? Because if you haven't, you probably should. You know. Okay, just another word about the bedding. So in a large enclosure like this, uh, again, you can see that this is open air, nice and open. Um, I'm only bedding where the animals actually lay down. You can see where the animals walk in. I'm not bedding down everywhere um, because it's just a waste of resources. This is generally where the animals lay down over here and over there. Um, and the rest of it, I just lime it and clean it up every once in a while and uh, leave it at that. So yeah, when it comes to waters, I guess that's a, it's a good transition to go to waters. You can see we've got a ewe over here drinking right now. Uh, so I've got these hog waters, um, and what I use is a submersible heater in them. You can use different types of heaters. I prefer the submersible one. Keeps it just above freezing temperatures, um, and it's enough to keep the tray from freezing up. Uh, I really like this. The thing that you're going to have to watch with them is that uh, if it gets direct wind on it, it does tend to want to freeze up the top, so you've got to pay attention to that. And the other thing that you have to watch with them is because of the significant temperature difference between uh, the water and the air, it's going to want to evaporate really fast. So even on a water of this size, we have to fill this thing every day. So definitely something for you to keep in mind. All right, so we're going to do kind of a walk and talk here. Um, as you can see, I do have this overhang broken down into different stalls. Um, that way I can use them for all kinds of different purposes. So this is my sick pen right here. Um, this little gal had a hurt uh, hoof the other day. And so I've got a wrap on her and I've got her in here just so uh, keeps her from, from getting out in general population and getting hurt. Um, but you can see I've got these separate stalls. I've got a stall here. I've got a creep uh, here. And then down here I've got a couple lambing jugs. So what is a lambing jug? Well, a lambing jug is a place that I can put a mom and the baby once they've actually, uh, once the mom is, has had her baby, I can put her in here. Um, there's a heat lamp, a water, and a place to put some hay and a place to put some grain, and it's nice and bedded down, and it's pretty small. You know, this pen itself is probably about six foot wide by eight foot long, um, and this is what you want to do after your babies are born. Uh, Babies are pretty resilient after a few days, but right up front, uh, if you just leave them out and leave them to their own devices, they're more than likely going to end up turning into little popsicles. Um, so what I like to use is I like to use uh, the lambing jugs. It helps to have a spot where mom can bond with baby um, and they get used to one another. They usually stay in here for about 48 hours after they've, after they've been born. Um, so as you can see over here, I've got I've got some outlets in every one. I've got some lights in every one. And then I can simply just plug these things in. Um, see if I can plug this in for you. There, and you can see my... Now you can see that heat lamp. Here's these old pieces of crap. And I'm just going to call them that because that's what they are. Um, this is a great way to burn your house down or to burn your barn down. These things are junk. Um, these uh, heat lamps that you can see, I've got one over here. I've got one here in the creep. Uh, those heat lamps are fantastic. They come from Premier. Uh, they're a little bit pricey. I want to say they're like 30, 40 bucks a piece, but I'm telling you what, uh, you don't have to worry about them falling down and burning your barn down or anything like that. They still use a regular heat lamp, but it's completely enclosed. Well worth the money. If you're using this stuff, just get rid of it. It's garbage um, and it's a fire hazard. So keep that in mind. All right. So, uh, feed considerations when it's really really cold outside um, they're going to eat more because they need to keep warmer and they burn more energy so if it gets down into single digits if it's getting down in the teens 20s even uh, you may want to consider feeding them a little bit more hay than you normally would just because uh, they need it for the extra energy a little bit of grain goes a long ways as well when it comes to uh, when it comes to helping them with getting more energy when it gets cold out as you can see, we got our little guys over here, and uh, we utilize sweaters. It helps to keep them warm. These guys are a couple days old. One's a week old. One is a couple days old, um, and their mom's nearby, and their mom's keeping a good eye on them. I think this guy is a week old, um, 
but yeah, he's doing good. He's got his sweater on. He's staying warm. Um, signs and symptoms of hypothermia. If you really want to know if they're hypothermic, well, first of all, they'll be uh, shivering and shaking. Next thing you can do is take your finger and put it in their mouth. And, oh, yeah, this guy's mouth is, like, super, super warm. Um, and that tells you that they're perfectly fine. If you stick your finger in their mouth that they're not acting right, you stick your finger in their mouth and their mouth is cold, you know you got a hypothermic lamb. Um, as long as they're up and going well and they're nursing off a mom well, you're not going to have any issues. They're going to stay nice and warm. But, again, first couple of days of the life, I want you to keep them in a pen uh, with a heat lamp, help keep them warm and let them get used to mom there's one of the moms right there as you can see she's never too far away um and she's checking on her babies and making sure that they're doing good uh so real quick i i meant to say this when i was talking earlier about the heat lamps and stuff uh creep uh if you don't know what a creep is check this out right here we have a special talking about creep feeders and what they mean but click on this and you can learn more about creeps so here is a creep as you can see, it's got these areas where the animals, uh, the small little lamp eyes can get in and the big ones can't. And that's a good idea. I've got my heat lamp in here. Um, what they'll do is the babies can get in here and they can get to where the heat lamp is and where the creep food is and the adults can't. If you just put a heat lamp out in general population, what's going to happen is, is the big ones are going to get underneath it and make a mess and the little ones won't be able to get in and utilize it and it just turns into a disaster. The big animals don't need a heat lamp anyways. Um, so if you're going to put up heat lamps, consider putting them in a place where the babies can get to them, but the adults can't. With that being said, let's check out a couple other uh, ideas that we use here on the farm when it comes to specific warm areas just for babies. All right, so here we are. This is actually my creep area for my goats. Um, I just used some panels here, and you can see if you pan over here and show them where the opening is, Watch this goat go through there. Yep, nice small little opening. You wouldn't even think they could make it through to look at it, but they can. And this, again, is a different kind of creep setup, but we can keep the adults out of here. Um, so I've got my creep feeder, and then you can see here I've got some hay uh, for them. Uh, my chickens are pooping all over. i got some hay here for them to get at, and then what I've got here is I've got a mini bulk that I've, I've installed a light fixture up in the top um, and I've hardwired it in to where I can plug it in. Um, and I've got a 300 watt light bulb in there, uh, just an incandescent light bulb. And what it does is it puts out enough heat in there that it keeps it probably 40 degrees inside that thing when it's zero outside. Uh, and this is kind of where all the babies congregate. I also have my valve open up here so I can actually get uh, airflow. I don't want it to get super stagnant in there or I'm going to end up with respiratory disease with my babies. But uh, the chickens like to hang out there as well, so I've got to constantly watch and make sure that I'm not getting chickens laying eggs in here. Um, but I don't restrict my opening to this thing um, because essentially, uh, yeah, it's like a sauna in there. It's not like a sauna, but it's warm. Um, I don't restrict the size of my opening because I don't need to. I have my openings restricted coming into the creep area. Now, if I had this out in general population, uh, I would want to restrict this opening somehow so the big animals can't get in here because that's exactly what's going to happen. The big animals are going to get in here and then there's not going to be any room for the little ones or the little ones are going to end up getting crushed. So this is one of two uh, ideas that we use here on the farm uh, as far as like kind of a larger creep. And here in a second, we'll move over to another one. All right, so this is a kidding pen. Um, same thing as a lambing pen. I just called it a kidding pen because the goat's in here now. But um, So she had these babies a couple days ago. She's just in here. Um, really, I could cut this in half down the middle if I wanted to. She doesn't need this much area, but uh, this works out fine. So she's got a couple babies on her. Again, we're here in segregation until the babies get used to being around her. Uh, these babies were a little bit weak when they were first born. Um, so they're spending a little bit extra time in here. Um, boy, they are just adorable. Um, so in here you can see we've got a little bit different setup. I really like this. Um, this is just made out of a 55 gallon drum, plastic, hard plastic, thick plastic drum. And again, I've got a light fixture up inside of there. Um, and I've got an opening small enough that the babies can get in there and mom can't. So when the babies get cold, the babies will go in here, um, get nice and warm, and then they come out when they feel, when they feel like eating. Uh, but these two little fellas here, I want to say are, uh, I want to say they are about 
three to four days old. So, and they are doing, they are doing just great. They'll go out in a general population um, probably in the next couple of days. We had sweaters on them, um, but they needed washed. So the sweaters are in the wash right now and really having the heat uh, jug for them, they really don't need it. So those are just some tips and tricks to keep in mind when it comes to raising these critters in cold weather. Thanks for joining us again. As always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, send us an email, let us know. Thanks a bunch, and we'll see you next time.